Hi, good evening or good morning, everyone. Um, I am Tim Morgo. I'm faculty at the University of Chicago, and I will be the moderator for this webinar. Welcome to this um, chest webinar on robotic bronchoscopy. We will be talking diagnostics and uh, potential therapeutic applications. It is my pleasure to introduce the panel today, uh, Dr. Jessica Wong Memoli. She's uh, Director of Interventional Pulmonology at uh, uh, MedStar Washington Hospital um, in Washington. And uh, Jessica, welcome to the panel. I, I have to say, I know that your paper, uh, the meta-analysis from almost 10 years ago now, right? It's probably one of the most cited papers in peripheral bronchoscopy. We were just talking about that a few minutes earlier. Um, and I'm looking forward to hear more about your studies and your practice with the robotic bronchoscope. Uh, it's also a pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague from Cleveland Clinic, um, Dr. Joseph Sisenia, who's a pulmonary consultant at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, author of several uh, clinical trials on peripheral bronchoscopy studies, uh, including the landmark study uh, published in CHEST uh, just uh, two years ago now, the benefit trial um, with the lead author, Dr. Silvestri from MUSC. And then uh, from Hong Kong, uh, from Chinese um, University of Hong Kong, uh, Dr. Calvin Ng, uh, Professor of Thoracic Surgery. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here, Calvin, today. Um, I know you'll be sharing with us your experience with the navigation bronchoscopy and bronchoscopic ablation for lung tumors, including now uh, some experience with the robotic bronchoscopic ablation. So looking forward to, uh, to your talk as well. So without further ado, um, I um, want to just briefly uh, describe the flow of this webinar. The, uh, <clears throat> rather than just uh, give a talk for 45 minutes and then take questions at the end, we thought it would be more engaging and more meaningful to address um, your questions on the go. Therefore, after each lecture, that will take about 10 minutes, we will um, take a break for about five, seven minutes for interaction and Q&A. And then we'll move on to the next um, topic. I know several of you have already uh, submitted uh, questions um, uh, during the registration process, and um, we will make sure that this will, those will be addressed. So I will um, start and set the stage with um, just a couple of slides, uh, because I think it's irrelevant to um, clarify some of the concerns in regards to diagnostic yield prior to starting looking into the data in more detail. But first I do wanna say and, uh, that this, uh, this webinar is sponsored by CHEST, um, but uh, with the industry support from uh, Johnson & Johnson, the manufacturer of the Monarch bronchoscope. Um, for more information about the device, please uh, check the IFU. And also please note that the faculty today will be compensated um, by, um, uh, by Oris Health uh, for this uh, talk. And also on this slide, as you can see, um, it's relevant to notice that the opinions shared today are the opinions of the uh, panelists and not necessarily the opinions of the uh, company. So I will start with this because um, <clears throat> as I um, review the literature, um, on uh, bronchoscopy studies, which will be addressed in more detail by Dr. Joseph Sisenia. You know, we are, we are puzzled to see how, how many diagnostic yields are reported out there in different papers. And some of them may be related to the technology, some may be related to the experience and expertise of the bronchoscopist or the instruments being used once, once a target is reached. But a lot of it has to do with um, uh, the way we define diagnostic yield. So I wanted you to reflect on, on a case like this. You know, you have a, a speculated nodule in a patient with emphysema and you do a bronchoscopy and your biopsy may show organizing pneumonia with multinucleated giant cells or non-small cell favor, I don't know, um, or an acute and chronic inflammation with some hemorrhage. You know, so which one is truly actually a diagnostic specimen? I think we will agree that B is diagnosis. Um, however, some studies um, will include A and C as diagnostic materials as well. Uh, similarly, for a non-diagnostic specimen, you know, necrotizing granuloma, 
an abscess with a specific um, infectious etiology, like you know, clearly a fungal culture that turns out positive, uh, lung parenchyma with anthracosis or, or a hamartoma. Um, a, B, and D are actually considered specific benign diagnosis, while C is really a non-diagnostic specimen. But these are not very, very clear in the literature. And I think what authors of peripheral bronchoscopy studies or bronchoscopy studies in general, what we agree on is that once we get cancer, we know that's a true positive, right? But what are the true negatives for malignancy, you know, okay, uh, maybe we can agree on non-diagnostic material. You get lung tissue or hemorrhage or blood clots, bronchial cells. That's pretty clear. Those are not representative of sight. But what about those benign diagnoses? <clears throat> and that's where um, a look, a critical look at the methodology of different papers is in order because a specific benign diagnosis, something that's actionable, Yes, that's likely a true negative for malignancy, and you could consider that a diagnostic material. You know, you get granulomas, necrotizing or non-necrotizing, a hamartoma, or a clear infectious, right, with a specific etiology. But what about these inflammations, acute and chronic inflammation, or lymphocytes, neutrophilic inflammation, organizing pneumonia, multinucleated gyre cells, or scar tissue of different, in different forms and shapes? Those are non-specific benign diagnoses, and they are not truly actionable <clears throat> because um, um, they are not firm pathologic diagnoses. So, depending on how one defines this non, this diagnostic, the diagnostic yield, um, and especially the non-specific diagnosis, the yield will vary from paper to paper. And again, maybe this technology related but very likely also um, the yield depends on the way we define it. We know we're familiar with um, the acquire registry by Dr. David Ost, who probably used one of the most strict definitions in um, um, bronchoscopy studies, because that definition did not allow for follow-up. The, the specimens were considered diagnostic either as cancer or a specific benign diagnosis at the time of the procedure. <clears throat> but, other definitions are more, more loose, you know, like um, one used by Dr. David Fielding in one of the papers that used the ion um, uh, robot, uh, the original paper actually, uh, from a few years ago in 2019, where <clears throat> the both specific and non-specific benign diagnosis were included at the, included at the uh, numerator. So in addition, for those studies that actually allowed for follow-up, and followed up the patients with imaging or biopsies. You know, if, uh, if some patients were lost to follow up, how was that data handled? Are they completely excluded from the analysis? Are they considered false and negative, in which case you create a worst case scenario, or um, true negative, and you include them in the numerator, in which case you may overinflate the diagnostic yield? And this is not a trivial issue. To me, um, the best definition comes from um, the paper that Dr. Josie Senia was co-author and again, the author lead, led by Gerard Silvestri and Alex Chen. This is the benefit trial published in CHEST. And the same definition was used um, by a group from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering in a paper that used the, mon the ION system, um, was just published in CHEST as well. So one with ION, one with MONARCH, these two papers use what I think is the healthiest definition of diagnostic yield. If you get cancer, then you have a true positive. If you get non-cancer, so non-malignant, if it's a specific benign diagnosis, yes, that is a true negative. Um, but what about if it's inflammation? That's only considered diagnostic if you can prove in follow-up that it either shrinks or disappears or you confirm it's truly an inflammation with a surgical biopsy. And again, this is not just a trivial issue <clears throat> because if you um, take a data set, let's hypothetically imagine a thousand patients um, and say 611 of them are malignant and 389 are not malignant. And then <clears throat> depending on how you handle the specific diagnosis, non-diagnostic and specific benign diagnosis and applying different definitions from the literature, we showed in a research letter that we just published in CHEST that you can show variability in yield of at least 20% for the same data set. 
just playing with different definitions, which is the reason why in um, the papers that are one of the reasons why in the papers published to date on diagnostic yield, which Dr. Josie Senia will elaborate more during this webinar, you'll see a bunch of yields reported in the literature. Again, of note, the papers that actually use a strict definition like the DACL paper in chest or CHAN in chest, and our more recent one that we published in Annals of Thoracic Surgery, you'll see a yield in the high 70s, low 80s versus yield in the mid 80s or even close to 90% in papers that have a, had a much um, uh, looser uh, diagnostic yield definition. So the truth uh, is we need to look at the um, the methodology uh, rather than just believe a statement that one technology is better than another. And that should be my knee-jerk reaction when I look at the paper on diagnostic yield. And then uh, again, maybe it's not just the diagnostic yield definition. Maybe there are other things that are impacting the yield, you know, such as the tools used to the um, uh, target or adjuvant technologies, which I know will be discussed in this um, webinar. So with that, um, my part is over and I will pass the microphone to um, Dr. Jessica Wong-Memoli to talk, us, uh, talk to us about why robotics, why do we even need this technology? Um, are they actually more beneficial than uh, what we have so far available on the market? Jessica? All right. So um, I really enjoyed uh, Tim's discussion because he basically shot holes in my entire famous meta-analysis, right? But we're going to first talk about um, robotics, and then we'll talk a little bit about that study. Um, and now looking back on it a decade later, why it's probably not, although everybody likes to quote it because it's probably, you know, was sort of the first one to look at all of this, is not the greatest of studies. Oh my goodness, did I just say that? All right, let's see. Let me make sure I can move forward. Uh oh. Okay, so I'm really going to go into why robotics and, and even really talk about what they are, because I think there was a question about really what's a bronchoscopy robot. So I'm just going to go through a little bit of what some of the previously reported diagnostic yields prior to robotic technology coming out. Um, what are some of the advantages? Um, and then uh, touch briefly on some of the out, um, sort of the gold standard and then just give a quick case presentation at the end. So ultimately, robotics falls within a realm of bronchoscopy called navigation bronchoscopy. Some people call it advanced diagnostic bronchoscopy. I think that's what the um, AABIP calls it. And essentially what, the, what we're talking about is not just regular conventional flexible bronchoscopy trying to get out to a peripheral lung nodule, but really a bronchoscope whatever kind of bronchoscope using extra technology to help you either visualize, reach further, maintain your position, um, or, um, or get you to the lesion a little bit more accurately. So there's a bunch of different technologies that people will use within this description of what navigation bronchoscopy is. Um, sort of from least expensive to most expensive, we'll talk about just regular flexible bronchoscopy with some added technology. So there's a radio ultrasound, which is um, the tiny uh, ultrasound probe that goes through a working channel of a regular bronchoscope, um, and it'll give you a radial image. And this is sort of just an example of an image um, showing that your uh, ultrasound is within the um, targeted um, nodule. Then there's ultra thin bronchoscopy, which is essentially a smaller bronchoscope than a conventional bronchoscope. So a conventional bronchoscope is about 5.8 millimeters external diameter. With some of these ultra thins, they go down to about four millimeters and some even smaller while maintaining at least a two millimeter working channel. So you can get all of your um, uh, biopsy instruments through it, as well as the radial ultrasound. So this was sort of um, the, the, quote unquote, cheapest method and sort of what was out there first. And I'm going to tell you, it's what I had until I got my robot um, uh, about a year and a half, not quite a year, and a, two years ago. Um, but it certainly allows you, if you know how to look at a CT scan and get out to a lesion, allows you to get out to some to things. Okay. And we'll talk a little bit about what the diagnostic yield is in some studies. 
Um, some people have the privilege of having a cone beam CT um, while they're doing bronchoscopy, which I think is amazing. So you um, are sitting there with your bronchoscope and you have your cone beam CT and you can sort of give a scan of the um, lungs while your scope is in there. And it says, oh, you need to go more anterior, more lateral, wherever with your scope. And that can help direct you to your lesion and then sort of verify that you're within a lesion. Um, uh, then we get to all the fancy electromagnetic navigation systems. So electromagnetic navigation came out probably about 2008, 2007, 2008, really started growing. And it was a big push. Oh, this is great. It's GPS for your lungs. Um, it's fantastic. You have this guy standing there holding the scope and then you have um, a, a, a virtual image of the lungs and it's telling you, oh, you're going to take this um, airway versus that airway. Um, but then um, at some point, you sort of don't really have a visual image of your um, airways anymore with your bronchoscope and everything is based on this ball that tells you you need to go up or down or left or right. Um, and you're just kind of moving in space, trusting that this technology works. But it was amazing because everybody's like, oh, it's going to be great. It's it's GPS, it's GPS. Um, and then the other company that came out was um, Baron, who came out with their sort of electromagnetic navigation system called Spin Drive. With both of these systems, as well as with the bronchoscopic transparenchymal lung nodule access, which is Archimedes, um, there's still a person standing at the head of the bed holding a scope. And, you know, these, some of these patients, they like to cough. So scopes get dislodged. If you have the privilege of having a fellow, fellows never stand still. Like scopes end up where they're not supposed to be and you got to get back to where you were um, and things like that. So um that those are um, some of the other advanced technologies. And then there's lung vision, which is what's called augmented fluoroscopy. And so you're still doing a bronch like you normally do, but they take the CT and they fuse it with your CRM fluoroscopy and they give you a little bit more directional um, capability. Um, and so in the same way sort of that you're still using your understanding of the CT sort of um, merged with the uh, floor, fluoroscopy can kind of tell you, oh, you're, you know, you need to be a little bit more anterior with your scope or a little bit more um, lateral or, um, you know, maybe more medial with where you are to try and get to a lung nodule. And then about three years ago or so was the robots. And, you know, I, there's a lot of excitement in the world of peripheral lung nodule navigation when you talk about robots. So the two pictures that you see down there um, are actually the uh, Monarch Oris robot. And essentially what a robot is, is you have your bronchoscope attached to two robotic arms or one robotic arm if um, with the ion intuitive. And instead of being the bronchoscopist holding the scope at the head of the bed or wherever you hold your scope right there with the patient, those robotic arms, those control the robot, those control the bronchi bronchoscope, and you're sitting there either with a little handheld cursor, a little bit like um, an Xbox con controller or um, sort of a ball, um, other device that controls the motions of the robot. So there's some you know, uh, uh, perceived advantages of being able to have smaller movements um, with the movement of the bronchoscope. There's also the stability of it because it doesn't move. Your patient's um, sedated, intubated, and the arms are still. So you don't have like some, you know, first year fellow holding a scope and things end ending up somewhere else. So there's the stability of it. Um, in addition to all the other technology, so it all these robots kind of combine some of the electromagnetic navigation technology with the um, stable robotic technology, as well as some of these advanced CT guidance systems. Um, and so that's really sort of what we're talking about today. Um, just to take a step back, looking at some of these other technologies about sort of how good um, they are, um, we'll take a step back to the radial ultrasound probe. So this is, again, the thin radial ultrasound ultrasound probes going, coming through the working channel of a regular bronchoscope, an ultra-thin bronchoscope. And there was a study by um, Nicole Tanner that was published in CHEST in 2018. And we used a pretty, pretty rigorous um, definition of diagnostic yield or um, diagnostic versus non-diagnostic. And as you can see, the yield's not so great, right? So 
sort of overall, everybody throws out these numbers. We try to get to a yield of about 70 because that's what lo and behold, Dr. Wong's meta-analysis meta said, and we're looking here at a diagnostic yield of only about 49%. And that's pretty terrible considering the comparator is about 37%. So why are we using this, right? So it's not significantly different. So it's great that we have this technology, but maybe in and of itself, it's not enough. Some of the meta-analyses that have been put out there, and again, we always have to look at meta-analyses with a little grain of salt because you're taking a combination of a bunch of studies and you're trying to use everybody's definition and think that it's all the same um, result coming out. So in these, the sensitivity um, in the Steinford article in ERJ was 49 to 88%. And then in the Ali study in respirology, they had diagnostic yield of 70%. So in both of these, we're still sort of about 70%, um, but potentially even less. Okay, so, and then this is the, the Navigate study, which is a prospective multicenter cohort study, which again, a bunch of people all together. Um, and again, diagnostic yield about 70%, right? So, but here we are with the pneumothorax rate that's pretty low. So now we'll talk about my study, which was published in CHEST um, almost basically a decade ago. And so essentially what I did was I took a whole bunch of studies that talked about the various um, guided technologies. And at this point, when this study was published, there weren't robots yet, but there was electro, a few electromagnetic navigation studies, a few CT guided bio, um, biopsy studies, uh, CT guided um, bronchoscopy studies, some radial ultrasound studies, um, and uh, some ultra thin and uh, uh, guide sheet studies. So basically, lumped them all together and said, here's the way to diagnostic yield of 70%. Well, there was a huge range, right? And, and Tim kind of showed you even within the robot studies, there's a huge range. And those range from sort of 60s to upper 80s. And there was, um, you know, everybody's like, the gold standard is to get to about 90%. And ultimately what we found, at least in this um, meta-analysis is that about 70% with the pneumothorax rate, about 2% with a chest tube rate less than 1%. So we're still stuck with this idea that our diagnostic yield is not wonderful. It's not terrible, not wonderful, not as good as a CT guided biopsy, but pneumothorax rates are much, much lower to, than um, CT guided biopsy, which is as high as about 25%. Um, and so then, the next sort of big study was the choir study from OS, which Tim mentioned, which was a multi-center registry um, uh, database um, with the endpoint of a diagnostic yield. Um, and then secondary was sort of of each technology. And then this one, the results were even worse, which is not unexpected because in this study, they were a little bit more, um, uh, they, they paid attention a little bit more to how the definitions were, which is exactly what Tim was talking about, right? The definitions of what is diagnostic and what is not diagnostic. The interesting part down here is all this fancy electromagnetic navigation. We're like, woohoo, yeah, it's going to be really great. It's really going to be great. Only had a 40 to 50% diagnostic yield, which doesn't make that technology look so great. <laughs> but nevertheless, it's what was there. Um, complication rate of 2.2%. So sort of in line with everything else with a pretty low pneumothorax rate, right? So here we are today, it's 2022, and we have robots, which is what we're talking about. So the two robot technologies are Monarch, which is Oris owned by Johnson & Johnson, and then Ion, which is Intuitive, which is the company that makes all those um, surgical Da Vinci robots. Um, while they the, the way that they work and not being an engineer, um, the way that they work is just a little bit different. So Monarch, the way they work is they have this navigation algorithm and computer vision. So they take the virtual image, mirror it to the bronchoscopic image and sort of then use that together with some AI to, to um, guide you to the nodule. Um, and then it uses an electromagnetic uh, platform, so, sort of like the um, Super D and spin to kind of tell you, yes, you are where you think you are. This is where you are, but it's got a little bit of extra tools. The um, 
the big thing with Monarch is that this, the bronchoscopy scope um, allows you, act, it's ultra thin, so you kind of get out um, more peripherally and you can still see what you're looking at in a lot of cases. In ION, um, their catheter camera is shape sensing. So their system knows exactly where that um, camera is at each per turn and point. Um, and again, you have a camera that goes out. It's actually a little bit smaller than the Monarch um, camera. However, it doesn't have a working channel. So once you get to the lesion that you believe that you're out, your scope comes out. So you sort of lose visualization there. So um, while they're both robotics, so they both have arms and you control it um, remote, sort of not right at the patient. Um, and they have all this different neat technology. Um, they have their pluses and minuses. So both companies sort of say the same thing about what the benefits are. So number one, extended reach, right? So Monarch says, we got reach. You can get out to peripheral nodules. Ion says the same thing. Um, they say uh, there's more stability so you can, because the um, robotic arms are stable, they don't move, things aren't moving around, you are where you think you are, and then you have more control and more precision. And so that's sort of the, um, the, the selling point for both systems. And why do we care? Why do we need to be able to get out to these individual little things out there? And I think Dr. Ng is gonna go into this a little bit more, but ultimately the reason why we wanna do it is because we wanna be able to reliably get out to a peripheral lung nodule for those patients who are not automatically gonna to go to surgery and get it cut out, right? We wanna potentially do therapeutics. So your patient comes in, they get their robotic procedure, they get staged, they get treated, and they're done, hopefully, right? So that's sort of the holy grail of all this peripheral lung nodule stuff. Um, and I didn't keep track of how long I'm going. And I just wanted to show some pictures real quick at the end of what um, a ro what the Monarch robot imaging looks like. So this is a patient, she's 83, and she had this left upper lobe sort of um, lobulated nodule that had been getting bigger. So this is what the um, bronchoscopic um, uh, uh, um, image looks like. So this is the actual bronchoscopic picture. Um, and as you're going in, the robot gives you sort of where you are along the path to your target. It also gives you the pathway. So it's taking your bronchoscopic picture and matched it up to a virtual picture. And you have this path that you go to. And then it gives you this other image, which kind of melds the CT image with the um, virtual image so that you know you've got to go up or down to get to this nodule. And then they call this the call of duty sign where you're facing right toward it. And hopefully you're a little bit closer than um, five centimeters. And this is my radial ultrasound picture. And this is sort of shows you how far up your scope, my scope went, and then how far my radial ultrasound went. And ultimately we were able to make a diagnosis on this patient. So it worked in this one, but it sort of just gives you an example. So that's the end of mine. All right, uh, Dr. Wang Mimoli, thank you for a concise review of the literature. So as um, for participants, please use the chat room or the Q&A to ask questions. And I know there are several questions submitted uh, again during the registration process. Um, and I think we should start answering some um, in a couple of minutes so we can move on. But uh, Jessica, there is um, one question in regards to training requirements for nurses and technicians. Can you briefly tell us how you implemented this and what kind of training your staff went through uh, to start your robotic bronchoscopy program? Yeah, so we got our um, robot in September of 2019. And what Monarch did was they actually took um, our, it was my thoracic surgeon who actually pushed to get it into the hospital first. So he got trained. They took both my um, thoracic surgeon and my tech um, out to California, which I don't think now because it's Johnson & Johnson, they need to go out to California anymore, but it was like a quick out to California. They spent a day sort of understanding the technology, how to set it up, how to break it down, how to troubleshoot, um, and um, where all the pieces went, how to put the patient, where to put all the probes, um, from everything to how to clean the robot, where your scopes go and all of that fun stuff. And then when then we um, started doing it and with every, you know, our initial cases, there was a um, rep at every case and sometimes more than one. Um, and, uh, um, 
and then they were there and they could help troubleshoot. And actually their, their customer service is actually really good. In the beginning, we had um, a few issues and if a rep wasn't there and I called, they were, they were always like, Oh, Dr. Wong, it's great to hear from you. And they could fix things fairly quickly. So. All right. And I see um, there, uh, there are several questions in regards to training and competency. Competency is a strong word and involves a lot of judgment, but um, the um, training uh, it is offered by, by the company. So uh, for those of you interested, please contact um, your company representative because there are training opportunities at their corporate office or in local regional centers. And I also have to say, as just faculty, there will be training programs at the chest headquarters. In fact, um, there is a program on peripheral bronchoscopy that will also teach robotic bronchoscopy uh, with different platforms, including Monarch. Um, and uh, navigation technologies, uh, that course is scheduled for um, August of uh, 2022 at the headquarters in, um, in Chicago. Um, and just to be cognizant of um, some of the questions raised here, um, I see at least three or four questions in regards to cost, um, because that depends a lot on the healthcare system and the setup. Is this done in the bronchoscopy suite or in the operating room, et cetera? Um, uh, we're, we're not in a situation to answer those questions. Please, again, contact um, your company uh, representative, and uh, they can get back to you on um, on addressing the cost issues pertinent to your institution. So now it's time to move on because it's 5.33 and um, uh, the next speaker, Dr. Joe Sisenia, will uh, give us a critical review of the literature uh, regarding the two technologies. Joe? So thanks, Tim. Um, my job uh, really today is to um, review the literature. Uh, so just the facts, Jack, no opinions, just, just, uh, just literature. And uh, I'm going to try to format uh, uh, each of the studies that have been published on, on robotic bronchoscopy in a, in a way that we're, we try to uh, uh, compare them, the, the studies, best we can. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about how they define their, their yield. We'll talk a little bit about their patient population. And I'll, I'll kind of pick out subtle points from, from each study. Uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, we'll, we'll kind of crescendo to a conclusion when we're done. So... Um, let me see, I can't. There we go. So just some just some disclosures, real quick disclosures, which you know everybody generally has. And uh, the first study that that um, I want to talk about is, which is really the first study and really clinical study in you know on patients, um, on live patients uh, in the literature, is um, by the original group. Uh, uh, really, it's probably one of the. Uh, uh, it's probably the people who had and bought these systems commercially early on. So uh, Erie, Chicago, um, several other places. And uh, they, I think they did a really great job. You know, they, they, they took this technology. They were the first uh, adopters to, uh, to use this technology. And they published their initial uh, uh, data, which, which, you know, I think is kind of courageous. Because when, as you all know, when you're starting things out, there's a lot of bugs to go through and there's some growing pains. So this was 165 procedures, 167 nodules, and um, includes really the first Monarch procedures at, at, at all these uh, clinical sites. Um, uh, just uh, this was done with, with first generation software. Again, you know, this is not current software. So these are the first users right out of the box. Their diagnostic yield was uh, defined as the percentage of procedures yielding a diagnosis based on final pathology. The follow-up test demonstrated alternative diagnoses, lesion growth, new lymphadenopathy mets, and the procedures considered non-diagnostic. And they did have a follow-up of, of roughly 185 days. In terms of their, of their patient population, you could see that here's their average uh, uh, um, lesion size. Most of the, their, their nodules were in the upper lobes, about a third were in the lower lobes, and, and I'm presenting this for reasons we'll talk a little bit about later. 70% um, of them were peripheral lesions, defined as the outer two thirds of the lung, and uh, three quarters of them were solid. And, uh, and I bring that up because 10% of them were ground glass, which, which may have an impact in how localization of, of the nodules was, was determined, because if you're using radial EBUS, you may have a hard time seeing ground glass nodules. And about 63% had a bronchocyte, which I think is about average for most of the trials. And here's their, here's their data. Their overall yield was defined somewhere between 69 and 77%, depending on how the inflammation, we heard Tim talk a little bit, a little bit about this before and how you define inflammation in terms of your yield. 
So uh, depending on how that was managed, if, if, if they actually had a, a follow-up or if they just considered inflammation as a diagnosis. Um, so somewhere between 60, 69 and 77 percent. And if you look at the breakdown of yield, um, you could see that uh, there, it didn't really matter uh, depending on where the, where the nodule was located. Um, uh, depending on the bronchocyne, they had a 78 percent yield with the bronchocyne, um, which, you know, I think brings up questions of did you have a direct view or not? Um, their uh, location, localization success, um, they only had about 70% localization using radial EBUS, but maybe that's uh, explained a little bit by their 10% ground glass nodules. Um, overall, they had an 89% navigation success, which is a combination of, of radial EBUS and whether or not they got diagnostic tissue. And you could see that in the rebus view, whether they had an eccentric or concentric view, it really didn't matter. Their yield was roughly the same. So uh, maybe they perhaps overcame some of the more um, some of the challenges that we see with plastic catheter-based technologies like, uh, like some of the other navigational technologies. And look, uh, even with no re radial EBUS image, they still had a diagnosis in one of four. So um, you know, I think that, that this was a pretty nice paper that they put out. Um, interestingly, uh, they, uh, they were able to see, um, uh, they had visibility in the, in the patients that had visibility. Um, uh, 80% was their yield. So not every uh, uh, visible lesion did they see, did they get a diagnosis? And you wonder if this is due to tool failure. Um, and you could see that as the, uh, as, a, as the nodules decreased, uh, the, the yield, uh, the nodule size decreased, the yield also decreased. So this leads into the benefit trial. And this was going on sort of concurrently to, to that registry trial. Um, and this was, uh, this was uh, uh, these, these, these weren't commercial use patients. These, this study was done for the specific purpose of getting some data. And uh, this was uh, several sites. It was the, us at the Cleveland Clinic. It was MUSC. It was, it was Alex in St. Louis. Um, um, and uh, 54 procedures, 54 nodules, um, five different sites that I talked about. And the primary outcome was lesion localization with, with, with radial EBUS. Our diagnostic yield, I think, was a little bit more strict. Uh, it was a biopsy that resulted in a specific malignant process or a specific diagnosis of a non-malignant process that explained the presence of the lesion, such as granuloma, or your saw fungal elements. Inflammation was, was, you could see, was considered diagnostic only if there was improvement or resolution or a uh, follow-up if, if uh, confirmed by surgical biopsy, as Tim spoke about before. Atypical cells notably were considered as non-diagnostic in this study, and all follow-up was for at least one year. And you can see the nodule properties in the right side of the slide. You can see the uh, you know, not average nodule size was, was 23 millimeters, which I think is you know, a standard size here. 60% uh, uh, had, a, had a bronchocyne, and about 30% uh, were in the lower lobes. The majority were in the upper lobes. And here's our, uh, here's our data. Um, overall lesion localization as defined by radial EBUS was 96%, but the overall yield um, was 74% when you had a, a radial EBUS view. So there's a, there's a drop, so you could localize, but, but, but not, in not all cases did you, did you get a yield. Um, and uh, 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 our categorization was, was defined as uh, by 30 millimeters. We didn't subgroup uh, uh, beyond that, and there was really no difference whether it was a large lesion or a mass or, or nodule. Um, Tim's group specifically at, at, um, at Chicago looked at factors associated with the diagnostic ac accuracy of robotic bronchoscopy with a 12 month follow up, right? So they looked at 124 consecutive patients and they specifically looked to see what fed into yield and what, what, what fed into maybe not getting a yield. Um, they had a 12 month follow up, at least a 12 month follow up on all of their patients. And again, similarly, they had a, a localization of 94% based on uh, system imaging, but if you looked at it just by radial EBUS, you had a localization of about 82%, an overall accuracy of 77%. And their accuracy and their yield was contingent mainly on, on a radial EBUS view, whether it was concentric or eccentric, it didn't matter. But if you had a radial EBUS view, you had a high outcome of getting a yield. If you didn't have a radial EBUS view, your yield dropped to 38%. And their bronchocyte notably was non-significant. Again, kind of feeding into this concept that that, that as long as you could get there, there's a pretty good chance that you're gonna get a diagnosis. And when they did a multivariate analysis, again, the only thing that popped out was, was whether or not you had a radial EBUS view or the nodule was, was, was big. So let's move into, uh, let's move into the ION uh, data. 
Um, this is one of the first trials uh, looking at ion data. This is um, this is a, a Ganesh Krishna uh, study. Uh, Fifty-two procedures, fifty-nine patients, um, and it, this includes. Um, oh, sorry, this is not Monarch. This is a, this is a typo. This is ion procedures at one site. All complete uh, cases were completed with, with ion, and they were confirmed using home beam CT. Our localization was con confirmed with CBCT. Their diagnostic yield, however, wasn't clearly defined in the trial. In, any inflammation was considered diagnostic. Uh, ap atypical cells were also considered diagnostic if the report said atypical cells favor malignancy. So this is a pretty generous uh, 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 diagnostic yield def definition. Follow-up time wasn't really defined, and, and there was some radiograph follow-up for, for less than a year. So, so looking at yield here, you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt. Here's their, um, here's their nodule property uh, uh, table. Um, their largest diameter nodule was, was 22 millimeters. Um, they, uh, most, of the, most of their uh, uh, nodes were in upper lobes, very few were in the lower lobes. And um, they had a little bit less of a, a, a number of bronchocyte nodules, less than what we usually see in these trials. So whether or not that impacted things, not particularly sure. 85% um, of their uh, nodules after their, um, after their initial um, navigation was localized using cone beam CT. Um, so they had a localization rate, I think that we could say around 85%. And if you look at their data, they had an overall, again, using their definition of, 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 of yield, an overall yield of 83%. Um, depending again how you look at it, you know you have to sometimes take this with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, this is uh, Arthur Sung's trial um, out of Stan out of, um, out of Stanford, um, and uh, this was the first uh, publication with ion in the literature. Thirty procedures, twenty nine nodules. Again, this is just purely a registry trial, an observation of this is what we did at, at, at our site. Um, radial EBUS was. Uh, used as confirmation and their diagnostic yield, again, because it was sort of an observation trial, wasn't specifically uh, uh, defined. Follow-up was for at least uh, six months. So a very kind of gen uh, uh, generous and, and, and liberal definition of, uh, of yield. And here's their nodule properties. Their nodules were uh, largest diameter in any dimension was 15 millimeters. So they kind of attack smaller nodules. Um, a bronchocyte present about 60%. And here's the, here's the, their, their, 93% localization rate, there's their localization data. And, um, and kind of again, using their somewhat liberal uh, um, diagnostic criteria, their diagnostic yield was at most around 80%, which is you know, not dissimilar to what we saw in real world clinical studies that were done with, with Monarch. And then uh, here's, you know, the, I said up until now, probably the definitive uh, uh, clinical trial or clinical observational trial with the ion robot. This was out of, uh, uh, this is the Memorial Sloan Kettering Group, Mochala and, and, and his partners. And uh, 131 procedures with 159 nodules, all ion, all done at one site. And their primary outcome was diagnostic yield per lesion. Their diagnostic yield was, was uh, very, uh, I think, you know, really hit the mark. It was, um, it was very similar to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the kind of stringent guidelines we used in benefit. Malignancy was, is con malignant was considered diagnostic and non-malignant, um, you know, had very strict uh, um, uh, yield definitions. All follow-up, again, was for a, uh, a year. So I think uh, their data here is, uh, is something to look at and apply to your data in the real world. Their average lesion size was 18 millimeters. A uh, nice spread of lower lobes, 34% of nodules in the lower lobe, and uh, a bronchocyte in, uh, in, in 62%, consistent with other trials. Um, the, in terms of targeting, it, 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 it's a little hard to look at it in this trial. Again, it, it, it was probably hard for them to report out because it's a sort of an observational registry trial. They only used radial probe to, to, to look at their targeting numbers in 85% of cases. In the other cases, they use 2D and 3D fluoro. So we kind of have to keep that in mind as we're looking at their targeting. They stated their overall localization was 98%, but it's unclear if, if there are any uh, imaging, image guide adjustments that were made at the time. I don't think there were. Um, uh, and again, some of their, uh, uh, their targeting was based on both radial probe and 2D, 3D fluoro. So I think that their targeting and their localization was pretty high, um, although putting an exact number on it, I think, is difficult. And if you look at their yield, their overall diagnostic yield was, was 81%, consistent with what we've seen before. 
However, if you kind of divide this up between nodules bigger and smaller than 20 millimeters, you're going to see a kind of a big drop off once you get under 20 millimeters. But I think this is consistent with what we've seen before. Again, it's real world patients, real world, real world situations. First 100 and 130 or so nodules, and again, courageous kind of trial to kind of put out there when you don't know what the results are going to be. And I think they had a pretty good yield. Um, this is sort of a summary of the of the of the studies that we that I showed earlier, and I, Tim showed a, I, I've adapted this from Tim's. Uh, so I have to give Tim some credit for this trial uh, for this slide. And you can see here when you look at all the when you look at all the studies, um, uh, for the most part, other than um, other than uh, uh, Krishna's or Ben's study in 2021. Uh, bronchocyne, about the same, their navigational successor confirmation, all very high, 85 to 90, 95%, depending on how you look at it. Um, and if you look at their yield, it's all kind of floating around the same, the, uh, the same number. Now, what's our, Bennett, what's, what's our basis of comparison? I guess you could look at uh, Navigate and say 73% for first gen uh, uh, EMN. So did we get a little bit better with this? I think we probably did. And I think there's, there's probably reasons for that, like we talked about earlier. Um, so, so, you know, what have we learned from this? I think the proposed advantages of, of, of robots are on the left side of this slide, you know, certainly a better tip integrity, right? We don't, we're not, we're not dealing with plastic catheters that go wherever the airway or the, or the tool wants you to go. We have much better tip integrity with the robotic, uh, with the robotic scope. There's greater reach to the per periphery. There's perhaps direct visualization of the lesion and, 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 you know, there's certainly a proposed advantage of better overall yield. However, what has the literature showed us up until this point? The yield has increased only modestly. Um, uh, localization seems improved, but we're not 100% sure based on some of the definitions that we've used. There's some mention of direct visualization, but really only in one trial. And uh, still, even when direct visualization occurred, the, the yield wasn't 100%. And the other interesting thing is yield seems not connected to radial EBUS confirmation, or at the very least, it seems not connected to whether you have an eccentric or concentric lesion. And, you know, you wonder if it's tied to the image guidance as much as it is the, the, the tip integrity. And it's really hard to kind of tease that out because these studies weren't really designed to show that. But I think as we move forward and design better studies, these are the things we need to kind of think about. So, you know, my last slide, where do we sort of go from here? I think, I think will AI improve, you know, the algorithms, you know, the ENB algorithms, the airway recognition, shape sensing to improve navigational success as we go along. I think there's some, I think there's promise here because, you know, what AI does, it takes everybody's data, kind of incorporates it and makes the algorithm better. So I, I, I hope it will, and, but we don't, we don't know for sure. Can the addition of real-time imaging enhance targeting and yield? I think these are things that we need to think about as we move forward. And, you know, and as we think about that, is there a role for combining the tech? So, you know, do we take robotic bronchoscopy and add it, add image guidance to that, whether it be SIOS, comb beam, lung vision, tomosynthesis, you know, uh, or do we in integrate it within one platform, um, which uh, NOAA Robotics is, is working on now? So in conclusion, I think interpretation of the current data, I think is difficult due to differences in study design and intended outcomes. However, I think we could kind of say that localization seems similar across both robotic platforms, although again, the definition sometimes is a little fuzzy. Um, yield lags behind localization for undetermined reasons. Um, it's unclear at this time how much in guidance, image guidance has impacted yield. Like I said, a lot of these trials were done um, uh, with, with, uh, with comb beam and, you know, if it has impacted yield to what degree, it remains to be seen if, if, if AI driven advanced targeting algorithms can improve yield over time. I think it's something we should definitely uh, kind of follow as we go along. And it really remains unclear if either platform can outperform each other, either, either in controlled published studies or real world settings. So look, um, I, uh, I really have to say that for the people who went out and did these trials they, and went out on a limb and kind of bared the, you know, their, their dirty laundry or their good laundry, I, I have to give them a lot of credit. And um, I think as we move forward, we'll, we'll develop better trials and, and uh, come to better conclusions. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, uh, Joe. Thank you for a great review of the literature. <clears throat> there are um, a bunch of questions which I do want to address before we move on to the ablation part of the, of the webinar. And, um, uh, with the risk of going over the um, time here. But um, there are several questions here that I'd like to discuss and uh, some of them I will answer and some of them I, I will ask the panelists. 
Um, so one of them that came a little earlier was in regards to, you know, how far the bronchoscope can go and that we can get in the same location with the, with the diagnostic scope. Um, that may be our clinical intuition at times, um, but then uh, data is what data is. If you look at the literature, the REACH study by uh, Alex Chen showed that when you compare the Monarch system with the P190 bronchoscope, which has a similar outer diameter, you can go farther into the lung with the, with the robot. Um, and the reason for that is the, the rigidity, the fact that there is a sheath and the a, a bronchoscope that offers that stability, um, usually in the central airway. So you can actually use that muscle, that push of the, of the bronchoscope. Um, there was a theoretical concern that may result in trauma and that's not been shown in the uh, original cadaveric study or in the human trials. So yes, for the same size bronchoscope, the robot does go further, um, despite of what we may think at times. The, um, the other question was, which uh, adjuvant imaging modality is better? Um, the, in the studies that um, were published to date, including ours, uh, most people just used uh, radialibus and fluoroscopy. A um, couple of papers used uh, Combeam CT and um, the paper by Ben that uh, Joe Sisenia nicely uh, reviewed for us. Um, in about 15% of patients, the lesion was confirmed with the cone beam um, and that requires some adjustment of the robotic arm. That was with the ion system. I don't think we're at the point where we can say that one adjuvant modality is better than another. Personal experience is with radialibus and fluoroscopy and the yield is what uh, you just saw on the, uh, on the slides. Um, another question is if the data in the diagnostic yield uh, included EBUS, I suspect you're asking EBUS tBNA from the lymph nodes. No, um, those patients um, are excluded from the study. If a diagnosis is made on the radial EBUS, uh, I'm sorry, on the EBUS tBNA from the lymph nodes, then really there's there's a little, little role for doing a peripheral bronchoscopy. So um, when we talk about diagnostic yield here is from the peripheral lesion itself. Um, and in regards to um, radialibus imaging, um, in our papers, at least, if there was no radialibus image, the yield was much lower than if we got the radialibus image. And just to clarify what Dr. Sisenia mentioned, um, there was no difference if it was eccentric or concentric. Um, pattern. And that's actually reproducible now. I think a paper looking at the ion system showed similar, um, similar findings. Um, and that's probably because once you're a target, if you actually work a target, if you insist, if you use needles, uh, eventually the diagnosis will be made. And then um, um, one question, actually, I want the panelists to answer this. Um, and Jessica and Joe, maybe you can chime in. Um, this comes um, from a clinician asking about um, the fact that some insurance companies consider navigational bronchoscopy as experimental and you know that may deny the procedure based on their quote unquote expert reviews. So how do you how do you combat that? Um, interestingly, you know, I, I'm in DC and I'm in the center of um, urban DC. Um, so we have a lot of Medicare, Medicaid, and they don't actually give me a push. It's usually a private insurance that gives a little bit of problem, but I actually, I'm not sure I've had any insurance companies deny the procedure. Um, usually um, what you can just tell them is that the ACCP recommendation as way back as 2013 is that a guided bronchoscopic technique should be considered if it's available. So if you have the technology and you can offer it to the patient, it's what's in the guidelines and the recommendation. So I've not, I don't think I've had anybody deny me doing a robot. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a CPT code um, that is a, a new CPT code. It's um, and, but it's, it, there's no specific CPT code for robotic bronchoscopy. So um, it's the same CPT code that you would use for any kind of guided uh, bron bronchoscopic technique, whether you're doing a super D, a lumicyte, lung vision, whatever, you, you know, radial probe, radial probe EWC. It's the same, um, it's the same code. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be an issue. Um, I think there, I think there's a uh, 31626, I'll double check. 
<clears throat> All right. Um, there, I'm going to address one more question here and then we'll move on. The, um, in regards to the learning curve, I do not have an answer. Um, the, Joe, actually, you, you looked at this in the past for navigation technologies, I think it was like a number of 15 and then the yield started to plateau. Um, that comes from super D times. Um, I don't think we know that for robotic bronc. You know, I would like to say that it's in the range of 25, but it really depends on lots of factors. Uh, a lot of it has to do with our hand-eye coordination and depth perception, et cetera. Um, so we do not have an answer for that at this time, but that's something I, we're actually Can I comment real, real quick on that, Tim? Yeah, please. Real quick, uh, we have a lot of, obviously we have a lot of users um, at, uh, at Cleveland Clinic and we, and we have a lot of, um, so there's been a lot of learning curve observations that we've made. And I, I will say that the, um, there's a learning curve both for this, your staff, you're like your nursing staff that are helping you with this, and you yourself as the operator. And, um, and that learning curve also is impacted by the size of the uh, nodules or masses that you start off with. So if you're gonna start off with a bunch of eight millimeter nodules, I think your learning curve is gonna be a lot longer than if you started off with a, a, a 30 millimeter nodule. So I think if you're starting off, my recommendation is to avoid the small ones, go with the big ones, your learning curve will be much steeper. All right. Um, as, uh, as we move on, I will answer some of these questions in the chat room, but uh, I will pass the microphone to our thoracic surgeon in the room here uh, talking about ablation. Calvin, you're on and please take your time. Well, it's clear that we're going to go over time. So not Thank to you. worry. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh Okay, so um, it's a real pleasure to be invited uh, to talk about um, our uh, small experience of bronchoscopic uh, ablation um, for a navigational system. Uh, we haven't actually uh, really done a clinical case in a robot to do ablation yet. Uh, it's sort of on a workflow. We're trying to uh, you know, work through some of that uh, right now, um, but uh, this is basically based on uh, navigation bronchoscopy. These are my disclosures. So. Ablation, basically, as you well know, is, is a kind of local therapy, essentially. Um, and it's often pitched against, um, you know, SBRT or even surgical wedge resection. Um, and conventionally, um, ablation, as you know, is uh, most of the data is from percutaneous uh, approach uh, using radio frequency energy. And in general, there's much less data than SBRT. So, um, you know, often... Uh, uh, in MDTs will be discussing, you know, patients not suitable for surgery and sending them for radiotherapy. But you have to remember the uh, conventional way of doing it uh, is associated with the high risk of pneumothorax or uh, even hemothorax, uh, bronchopleural fistula, and uh, has limited access from percutaneous route, um, you know, uh, depending on where the lesion is. And these reported complications can be as high as uh, between 11 and 52% in some of the uh, meta-analysis that reported. Um, also, radio frequency tend to have a smaller ablation zone uh, because it's dependent on uh, resistance and the conduction of the um, uh, current. And once that's uh, basically um, uh, the area around the probe um, becomes charred, then that doesn't conduct uh, electricity anymore. So it hasn't been very popular. And you also have to remember um, behind all this in terms of SBRT, although it's very safe, um, a significant proportion of patients do get radiation pneumonitis and potentially pneumonia in some reported uh, analysis as well, up to 22%. One of the potential game changers um, um, for all of us is uh, doing this through the endobronchial route, which is maybe associated with uh, decreased uh, risk of all of these complications, pearl-based complications essentially, and changing the energy that we're gonna be using uh, with regards to a microwave rather than a radio frequency that produces a more predictable and a larger ablation zone. There are a whole host of meta-analysis reviews out there, essentially, that compare the different, you know, local treatment modalities and the survivals and the recurrence rates. And it kind of depends on which papers you pull out and how you, you know, uh, analyze which group of patients. This um, meta-analysis and review um, is from Yale, um, at Yale's group, and really looks at uh, pulling out all the data from patients who have a definitive diagnosis, biopsy proven diagnosis of non-small cell lung cancer, which is one of the strengths of this study. And they managed to find um, like a thousand patients with uh, who's had thermal ablation, mostly for, 
group percutaneous and mostly through radio frequency. And versus, look at this number, it's hugely more in terms of um, comparison which is through uh, having had radiotherapy. Hence, as I was saying, that a lot of the time uh, patients are sent for radiotherapy um, uh, and not, ablation is not even considered. And in this paper, basically, they found regarding overall survival, um, there was no inf inferior um, uh, data that can be found um, when compared with uh, SBRT. Um, so um, this is kind of encouraging, at least uh, on the superficial uh, analysis. Um, we started doing um, our first uh, cone beam CT hybrid operating room um, uh, bronchoscopic guided microwave ablation uh, almost three years ago now. And this was the first case where there's a left upper lobe tumor. Uh, patients already had lung surgery on the other side, doesn't have enough lung function. And uh, with proper consent, we uh, ablated that lesion. And this was the post ablation 10 minute uh, imaging. The first sort of collaborative international study was an Ablate study um, of uh, 30 patients um, that was uh, discussed in abstract uh, format um, uh, recently um, in a European meeting. And um, essentially, um, the in inclusion criteria are those patients who had biopsy proven uh, lung cancer um, and uh, malignancy. And it cannot be too close to the pleura. Uh, it has to be more than five millimeters. And those patients who've gone through MDT who decline or cannot have surgery or uh, SBRT. And of course, you need combium CT to essentially, um, uh, uh, you know, confirm that you have successful navigation and ablation. And this is a perspective, of course, non-randomized or anything study is just to look at safety. And within the 30 nodules, uh, two thirds were for primary lung, whereas a third were for, for metastasis. And uh, two thirds were on the uh, outermost third of the lung, whereas a third of the patients roughly was, uh, were in the middle, uh, middle zone, middle third of the lung. Uh, nodule size is between five millimeter to 27 millimeter with a mean of uh, median of 12 millimeter. The technical success rate of reaching a lesion and blating it and covering the whole nodule was 100%. And the mean ablative margin was about nine millimeters. And we were just looking at safety. So the one month uh, uh, efficacy rate on the based on the follow-up CT scan was good 100% that the ablator zone covered uh, the lesion with uh, no observed progression. Um, in terms of adverse events, uh, many people would be interested in these. Um, one uh, possible ablation device related event was a uh, mild hemoptysis that was just self-limiting. We didn't need to give any kind of transamine or anything like that uh, to stop it. And there were four subjects who had nine uh, events that were, I would consider as relatively uh, uh, mild that may be, re may be related uh, uh, to the study uh, procedure itself. Um, there were two cases of pleural effusion. Uh, one required a uh, pigtail drainage and um, and some two post procedural pain. One sort of inflammatory response with a low grade temperature, and uh, and one case with post ablation syndrome um, with regards to a low grade temperature and you know elevated white cell count and this, and the slightly sort of um, uh, white whitish um, uh, out of the radiology and X ray. There were no deaths or pneumothoraces um, in the thirty cases. And essentially, um, we've shown that this kind of approach is a potential option for malignant lung nodules up to 30 millimeters uh, in select patients who are not suitable for other types of treatment or decline other types of treatment with low complications and high technical efficacy. Outside of the navigation study, navigate study, uh, our own experience of those who did not meet those criteria, we also looked at, and uh, it just so happened to be also 30 cases when we published this uh, early last year. Um, and in these 30 lesions, um, they had relatively uh, moderate uh, comorbidity index as expected because they were not really for surgical candidates per se. Uh, mean age was between 50, uh, range of 54 to 87 years old, and uh, the lesions were around two centimeters in size. Um, range from eight millimeters to three centimeters. Um, there's no blood loss really associated with this procedure and they stayed for one day on average. Um, there were a couple of cases that actually needed double ablation in the same session because the lesions were quite big and we needed to make sure that the ablation zone covered the lesion. A um, couple of cases that we did within the 30 cases that we did a concomitant biopsy and showed with a uh, real time, you know, um, uh, frozen section, uh, for example, that it was a tumor. And then uh, we proceeded with ablation in the same session. The whole procedure um, takes about two hours on average for these cases and involve a number of uh, cone beam CTs. And the margins we got were about a minimum of six millimeters for these 30 cases. In terms of a double ablation, um, uh, what we mean sometimes is this, when you have a big lesion, 
function, you would navigate and place the um, catheter, the antennae, microwave antennae in one side of the lesion, because you know you're not going to capture the whole lesion. And then after the burn, you'll re-navigate and place the catheter on the other side of the lesion in order to capture the whole lesion with a relatively good margin, as you can see here, um, after double burn. Um, in terms of complications for these uh, 30 uh, additional cases that we reported, um, there were uh, two pneumothorax uh, um, uh, that required a drainage and um, just two, you know, what we call low temperature, temperature ablation reaction, one hemoptysis, again, that was self-limiting, and um, uh, one infected uh, effusion that required drainage and a more prolonged hospital stay for antibiotics. In terms of pain, it's interesting to see that over 80% uh, don't have any pain at all after the procedure. This is our uh, 30 cases as we got uh, better at it. I guess you can see a trend towards uh, quicker procedural times, but there were some blips. I think we were being less selective in the cases uh, that we're, gonna, we're doing uh, in terms of uh, nav being able to navigate there or placing the catheter in the right place. So there were some challenging cases where we uh, took longer to do uh, to reach the lesion. Subsequent to those um, sort of 60 cases or so, we did have a case that um, had a delayed presentation of bronchopleural fistula after a bronchoscopic uh, microwave ablation. And uh, essentially the story was this, it was a right middle lobe lesion here that uh, underwent um, ablation. And the catheter during the procedure, you can see, uh, we did not create a pneumothorax. We placed the um, imprint catheter uh, um, within, you know, cl quite close to the pleura. Uh, we burned uh, the lesion, which was uh, satisfactory. And we actually sent the patient home uh, the next day because there was no pneumothorax on the cone beam CT post-procedure. He actually presented two or three weeks later with a some shortness of breath and X-ray and CT scan show there was a hydro pneumothorax. We put in a drain and there was a persistent air leak and you can see the um, the, the track there uh, into the middle lobe. And this is the burnt uh, area that we, uh, corresponding to the um, procedure day. Uh, we paste a endobronchial valve um, immediately and that stopped the air leak. Um, and the next day we're able to remove the drain, send the patient home and six weeks later, we remove the EBV. And you can see the track is actually healed on the CT um, uh, at that point. So, um, there, oops, sorry skip that one. Um, so you can also see that um, apart from ablating single lesions, uh, you can also ablate more than one lesions in one go. Uh, you can see this is a very unfortunate lady who's already had a lobectomy and a segmentectomy on the right side and then has multifocal adenocarcinoma and now has a uh, ground glass uh, new change in the left lower lobe and left upper lobe. And we ablated both of these lesions. And these are kind of ideal candidates in some ways uh, that you don't you want to preserve lung function um, to ablate. And these are the two post ablation uh, areas on the cone beam CT immediately after the procedure uh, on that day. A lot of people, of course, don't have cone beam CT and I truly understand that. And we're kind of um, working towards uh, introducing a potential mobile uh, C-arm with a 3D CT reconstruction to replace uh, cone beam CT in order to uh, able this technology to be used in more centers. And uh, we kind of uh, looked at our first 10 cases of experience and there were some limitations in seeing some of the ground glass, pure ground glass opacities, um, but essentially um, it can be done um, uh, for biopsies. Uh, dye marking and ablation as well. Um, this is the comparison of the image quality. This is the cone beam CT uh, in a hybrid operating room, and this is the mobile CT uh, unit, the, the images that it gives. Um, it's quite comparable. You can see that you've reached a you know, particular lesion with the tool that you've deployed. Um, there's a little bit more snowflaking and some gray um, sort of discoloration, but essentially um, in most cases where the lesion can be seen uh, that's not pure ground glass uh, change, uh, it should be uh, satisfactory. Um, of course, um, we then uh, moved on to uh, have some experience of using uh, robotic bronchoscopy. Uh, we started doing it uh, with, you know, very uh, uh, sort of uh, sort of Early in our experience, we started in December uh, last year. Uh, we've done just over 10 cases um, uh, of using uh, this uh, new technology. And this is one of our uh, first or second cases where we navigated to the uh, right lower lobe, I think. And um, we use cone beam CT actually with the uh, Oris Monarch system. And you can see on the cone beam CT in the hybrid operating room that we've definitely hit this uh, lesion, which is about uh, 1.52 cm in size and got a diagnosed adenocarcinoma. 
Um, of course, uh, robotic bronchoscopy, we do hope that we are able to stretch it uh, to use it for uh, dye marking, which is already being used in the US in a lot of cases, and um, also for uh, placement of facial markers for radiotherapy and uh, eventually uh, to do ablation in the same way that we've been using navigational uh, bronchoscopy to do ablation, uh, but using robotic platform. Um, alternate energy ablations, um, uh, we heard that from uh, 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 Joe and also uh, uh, from Jessica. Uh, essentially, um, others that to consider in the future, including uh, steam vapor type ablation, uh, as well as um, uh, pulse electric field ablation uh, for uh, certain tumors that may be close uh, to critical structures, as that, that doesn't really um, uh, create much heat in the process. Um, we did see... Um, one of the previous speakers mentioning uh, potential for drug delivery um, into the tumor and uh, having a um, carrier that will spread that particular drug or even uh, genetic material that will alter how the cancer behaves in the future. And that's really exciting. And uh, all of these, of course, you need a very accurate navigational platform, be it robotic bronchoscopy or uh, EM platform to get you to that particular lesion. So I um, just flew through um, ablation um, for you. And uh, I think in a summary is that basically in very highly selected patients uh, at the moment who are surgically contraindicated, gone through the MDT and um, they are not uh, candidates for other types of therapy or decline other types of therapy. This type of transbronchial microablation is uh, feasible and is a safe technique uh, for treating early lung cancers and potentially lung metastasis. Um, I think it really does have fewer pro complications when compared to percutaneous ablation approaches in literature um, and has uh, at the moment in our hands uh, uh, comparable early term local control rates. Um, the midterm and the uh, long term uh, results are of course still pending and will be very interesting to see and analyze. So I think um, everybody can keep calm and I think ablation is really here to stay at least for now. And thank you all very much for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Calvin. I appreciate the concise talk and really pioneering work that you're doing. Um, there are um, questions that were submitted by participants, you know, again, during the registration process. And if there are more questions now, please use the chat room. Um, but I have two, two questions for you. Um, one is, what's the percentage, in your opinion, the percentage of lesions that actually need ablation for curative intent, I'm talking lung cancer, primary lung cancer, early stage, not oligometastatic disease, but stage 1A lung cancer that will require ablation. Um, in other words, what's the percentage of non-surgical candidates and not SBRT candidates? Um, just to give us a perspective on like how often will this procedure be performed? <clears throat> oh, sure. That's a, that's, that's a great question. I think it depends, of course, on um, your you know, institution of how aggressive um, surgery is and also how aggressive your uh, radiation and oncologist is in, um, you know, radiating uh, the near field and so on. So um, we perform this uh, ablation probably um, four, four or five times uh, a month um, in our um, institution. And um, we are kind of, ablate, we're getting referred more of these cases for consideration because there's availability of this technology. And I think also the radiation oncologists realize that, you know, for some cases um, it's, it's better to have a local heat ablation than having, you know, blast from outside that can cause complications with regards to pneumonitis and also uh, respiratory compromise. Um, sometimes a month or two after the radiation has been, uh, has been, has been given. And of course, um, there are areas where that the uh, patients already had radiation and cannot have radiation again. And, you know, interesting enough, we can actually um, ablate those. We can ablate the same area as many times as we want. And after the ablation, even if it comes back and we cannot ablate, we can send the patient to the radiation, you know, oncologist if the patient has not had radiation before. So, you know, we can be like the first line of local therapy in some ways and, you know, radiotherapy can, mm -hmm. can you know, uh, be the, the second line, if you like, in some, in some aspects. In, in, in those lines, you know, we, we talk about thermal ablation a lot. And um, as you probably know, in the United States, there were some concerns about um, um, hemoptysis. And I believe even in your case series, you described that as well. 
And a lot may have to do with um, dosimetry, you know, like how much energy should be applied, which I don't think we know for a fact um, what the right um, dosimetry should be. So what about uh, non-thermal ablation, like photodynamic therapy or intratumoral injection of uh, drugs or nanoparticles? Um, what's your take on that? And can you, can you share your thoughts with us? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, injection of drugs, as um, many of you are probably involved in uh, early studies with a lot of um, uh, uh, companies uh, now and in looking into that kind of therapy um, of uh, particles or, you know, viruses or, you know, um, lipid particles that can carry drugs, uh, chemotherapy agents uh, into uh, that can be taken up into the tumor and can transfect the whole tumor. So you don't need to inject every single part of the tumor. Um, there are, of, of course, also in development, you know, that uh, carriers of um, nucleic acid material that can be incorporated into the cancer and taken up and expressed by the cancer, very much like the vaccines that we have these days. And that can actually itself change the molecular behavior of the cancer to make it uh, you know, much more, uh, much less aggressive and perhaps more uh, amenable for, for therapy. So I think that's all in the pipeline in the next uh, five to 10 years. So we really need to have a good uh, ability to use bronchoscope to get to the lesion and maybe to different parts of the lesion to deposit these uh, interesting uh, uh, drugs. In terms of um, thermodynamic, uh, um, photodynamic therapy, uh, we haven't had any experience. Uh, we really try to get our hands on it, but in uh, Hong Kong, it's um, uh, there's only one um, uh, photosensitizing uh, agent that's available for kind of eye treatment. We don't actually have in our uh, ability to get that. Um, uh, material, chemical. I think it hasn't been very popular in Hong Kong because you do need to stay sort of out of the sun for uh, you know, a number of uh, days uh, afterwards. Uh, uh, that's my understanding. And, and it's a little bit difficult um, in terms of a patient's uh, you know, preference or acceptance for that. But um, I see very good results in a lot of the, the, the uh, studies um, that are you know, pushing the boundaries in that area with peripheral lesions um, to doing P PDT. I haven't really had experience with cryo either, uh, although we've got uh, cryobiopsy, but we're not uh, not ablation. Um. Yeah, there, there are some reports using electromagnetic navigation with uh, PDT for non-surgical candidates, and I mean small case series, and um, definitely no hemoptysis. But I do think we need to learn more about the ablation zone. Um, there are um, um, many other questions that I trust there will be some way of answering to the participants um, outside of this webinar, maybe the, contacting them directly using the chat platform, um, because we are indeed uh, 20 minutes over time here. So if there are no other questions from the participants or the panelists, I do want to take this opportunity to thank the faculty for joining today and sharing their expertise and the review of the literature. I also want to thank uh, Johnson & Johnson and Chest for offering us this venue to share our experiences. So I, I hope you all stay well. But before we leave, um, I want to take each of you one at a time. And if you have to summarize your talk in one take-home message for the audience, what would that be? So Dr. Wang Mamali, we'll start with you. Oh, you put me on the spot. <laughs> we'll um, go chrono chronologically here. Um, I think, you know, the, the technology that's coming up with robotic technology is really exciting. Um, and so I think we have to see where it um, ends up and how it goes and what it really allows us to do. It's really exciting technology. I've really enjoyed having it and learning how to use it and then seeing what it can do. It's been pretty amazing. Joe? I can't believe you did this to me, Tim. <laughs> the on the spot. Jessica let you off. It's a desirable discomfort. Yeah. A desirable yeah, discomfort. A desirable discomfort. Okay. I think um, I would say uh, that um, we have uh, some data right now that are promising. Um, nothing really differentiates uh, 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 either one now, a uh, robot. And um, however, I think that um, the, the tip integrity the structural typical integrity that we have um, and is, is, is applicable, uh, especially with how Ka uh, Calvin uh, uh, talked about uh, ablation and, and your questions on, um, on intratumoral therapy. We never would have been able to do that with a plastic catheter based technology. So there you go. 
And Calvin? Yeah, so I'm so for bronchoscopic ablation, I think, um, you know, I'm not necessarily recommending it as a therapy. I don't think it's really, you know, ready to so-called go into guidelines and prime time per se. We're still uh, going through our um, series to look at uh, midterm and long-term results as we reach our three years, you know, um, lamp, you know um, mark with our, from our first case. Um, but I think it is uh, safe um, when it's it done in select cases, I think. Um, and, you know, we should not um, brush ablation aside and dismiss it. And it should be potentially discussed as a, you know, a form of treatment in our MDT. Um, and because we have done a bit more bronchoscopic ablation, actually the discussion about percutaneous ablation in our MDT has also come up um, as a potential option, uh, which was really just brush aside very, you know, previously. So, um, you know, this is the place to watch uh, uh, in the coming uh, few years, I think, um, as navigation technology, imaging uh, technology and ablation technology come together and uh, become available uh, more uh, globally. Thank you, Calvin. As for me, I, um, I would just tell the participants who had questions about the different systems and which one is better. There are questions about how do they compare and how do they compare with the traditional uh, navigation technologies. I would say critical look at the literature. Please take a look at the methodology based on the issues discussed today. And then ultimately get your hands on experience, a training program, sort of the um, corporate office and decide on your, on your own, you know, what fits your, um, what fits your practice. It ultimately may come down to philosophical approaches in believing in stability, in vision, et cetera. Um, so, um, uh, as more data and randomized studies are coming out. So until next time we see each other um, virtually or in person, uh, please stay well. And um, hopefully you and your families um, will do well till the end of this pandemic. Um, goodbye, everybody. And thank you for joining our chest webinar series. Bye-bye.